Isaiah chapter 6 this morning. I want to share a message with you, continuing in our series uh, from Revival in the Bible uh, called Revival When Your World is in Crisis. From Isaiah chapter 6, Revival When Your World is in Crisis. I came to this passage and into this uh, period of, of Israel's life this week as God, as I was praying and God led me here to this passage. And I was reminded of a story that kind of encapsulates where Israel was at in their history and in their relationship with the world, uh, with the Lord, rather. The story is told of about a young boy in, in, in U.S. history class and his teacher sees that he's kind of drifting, and she catches its, his attention, and she says, Billy, we're talking about the Constitution today. Do you mind informing us who's, who signed the Constitution? Billy's response was, ma'am, I don't know, and I don't care. And she was kind of shocked, and she said, Billy, I'm going to, now, Billy, I, I, look, I didn't mean to embarrass you. I'm going to give you another shot at this. Who signed the Constitution. And he said, ma'am, I told you the first time, I don't know and I, and I don't care. And she said, well, Billy, we're going to have to have a conference with your daddy. So you make sure that your daddy's here tomorrow, so we're going to have this conference and we're going to get this straightened out. She informs Billy's dad when he shows up for the conference, she said, I asked Billy who signed the Constitution. Go ahead, tell him what you, see, what you said. He said, I don't know. I uh, I don't care. And he said, Billy, come on, son. I've got work to get back to. If you've signed that thing, just tell her so I can get out of here. <laughs> Two words. Ignorance and complacency. Really summarized is where we're at with Israel's relationship with God as we come to this passage. The last few weeks we have looked over how God raised this nation out of all the peoples of the earth to be his people. And he did that through Jacob and then began to move them into, into towards the promised land. But in time, after the time of the judges, Israel forgot a fundamental doctrine, you might say, of their constitution, that God is king. And so in time they cried out for an earthly king to be given to them so that they could be like all the other nations of the world. And so God raised up the first king, Saul, and then established a throne through David, continued that through Solomon. And after Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was split into the northern part that we know as Israel and the southern part that we know as Judah. And in time there were a number of kings that would come to pass. The average rule of these kings was about 15 years. The majority of them did evil in God's eyes. There was constant change, constant turmoil around them, but Israel kind of got used to it. By the time that we come to our passage here in Isaiah chapter 6, Israel was on the brink of disaster. And God raised up a man to tell them that if things didn't change, that they would be led away into captivity for 70 years. God had a man at a time to tell them God's message that they needed to come back to God. So we look at the world all around us and we look at some of the crisis going on around us in our world, I'm reminded more than ever that we need to come back to God. Amen. That God's the answer that we're looking for. Yeah. And this morning I want to share a few principles with you from this passage, from this scene in Israel's life, this snippet of their story about how God wants to bring us back to Him that our hope and all of our, and to be reminded that our hope needs to be in Him, that He has the answer that we're looking for, that our world needs, that when we will come back to him, that he will provide everything we need in him. If you're there with me, pick up in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 together with me this morning. 
The Bible tells us, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, this is Isaiah speaking, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Verse 3, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, verse 5, I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, or I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you together as we gather together this morning. We know that our hearts need a word from you today. We've gathered into this place to worship you because you are worthy and you are great. You are perfect and you are unlike us. And you deserve our praise this morning, God. Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning to draw us into better fellowship with you. God, those of us who know you and know your Son is our Savior, God, that you've brought us in here so that before we leave today that you would identify something in our life that we need to surrender to you, that we could be more like Jesus when we leave this place. God, we pray you would do it by your, by your Spirit. God, those of us here that, that are here that may not know Jesus, in a room this size, surely there's one. God, we pray that you would speak to their heart, that they would come to know your son, Jesus, as their Savior before they leave today. We ask for you to have your way in this place, that what takes place is not simply the words of man, but the movement of your Holy Spirit in our presence. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I want to share with you just a few things that we see from this passage if we are to experience revival when our world is in crisis, the first truth that we need to know is that we can cling to God's unchanging character. Amen? You can always cling to God's unchanging character. Here in the first three verses, Isaiah has an encounter with God. He is there. This is his commissioning as a prophet to Israel to go tell them God's message. And to call Israel back to God. And there as he is commissioned, he, he has a vision of being caught up before the very throne of the Lord. In the highest of the heavens, caught up to see who God is. Reminded of who God is, who we are in front of him, how bad we need him. And because he's the answer to everything that we need. Verse 1 tells us, however, tells us that that he had this vision in the year that King Uzziah died. Watch this, don't miss this. King Uzziah died and then he saw the Lord. I believe God's message to some of us is that there are some things in our lives that need to die before we can see God move in our lives again. This event goes back to 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verses 16 to 23. King Uzziah had become king in Judah uh, during that time when he was 16 years old and he had a mostly successful reign for some 52 years. Most of the, the part of his reign was marked by prosperity and peace and technological progress in that time. And his, the Bible tells us that during his reign that his fame spread all about the world, meaning that they, that the world understood that God had Israel's back during that time and he wasn't to be messed with, that God was pouring out blessing and favor on him. That is until the last part of his life. 
And in the last days of his life, Uzziah uh, forgot how God was mercifully pouring out his blessing and his grace and he got puffed up and prideful in his heart and he went into the temple to perform sacrifice that only the priest and the Levites were to perform. And God struck him with leprosy and he died. There's an expression that says that as the king goes, so go the nation. Uzziah was representing where Israel's heart was at there and they had forgot their need for God and then God stepped in to let something die to remind them about their need for him. Oftentimes God does that in our own lives when we, when we have been walking with him and he has been blessing us and over time we forget that it was the hand of God that poured out in kindness and in goodness upon our life. And instead, we can begin to think that it is the result of our own effort or our own skill or our own wisdom. And so God will step back and give us a reminder that we need Him. God went to work in the midst of their situation to transform His people through His process. When, I, when Uzziah died, the Bible tells us that the people panicked that they had put all their hopes in an earthly king, forget, forgetting that all their hopes should have been in the king of kings and the Lord of lords that sits on the throne. And there are many times in our lives where we put our hope and our confidence in many other things outside of where they should be. And in, in those times, God will draw us back and allow us to go through circumstances to remind us that our hope and our assurance and our comfort needs to be grounded in Him. Y'all know that I am what you call a, a transplant to Texas, amen? And y'all have been so good to love me anyways. But several years ago, uh, when I first got, felt God calling me to go to seminary, I, Sarah and I were at a, my first pastorate. I was bivocational there, and we... I just felt that God was calling us to, to go to continue to be equipped and prepared uh, through some theological training. And we, uh, I, things seemed to be going so that I could go to Fort Worth at, at the seminary up there at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, the Southern Baptist Seminary. Uh, preachers would have laughed at that, that's okay. We email corresponded there, and we made application, and they told us that, that really there, there wasn't really housing available at the time for us to be able to go. But we were praying, and we were seeking God's will, and we went, and we made the application, and no sooner than we got the application submitted, they responded and said, hey, we, we've had something open up. So we went, and I had this big dream, man. And I, I went down thinking, okay, God's opened this up for us, and it looked like he had parted the Red Sea, amen? I got there, and we started having trouble like you wouldn't believe. Nobody in the greater part of Fort Worth was really impressed with my Bible degree. I couldn't find work. My car was falling apart. The money that we had saved was, man, our bank account was bleeding. Finally, the... Uh, God humbled me, and I found work through a temp agency called Express Personnel, building uh, blower motors <laughs> that build up uh, bounce that blow up bounce houses. I couldn't figure out what God was doing. I couldn't get any help through the office at the seminary to find even a position there on the grounds. Nothing. I had to learn to rebuild the front end of my vehicle, uh, thanks to mechanic and YouTube. Amen. But I ran up against something with my car that I couldn't fix. I didn't have the equipment. I couldn't negotiate at the pawn shop uh, to get the tools that I needed. Because I didn't have any money. Sometimes I would take a tool and I would trade. Amen? And so I had to take my car to a mechanic. We really didn't have the money for it. And I had to walk from the mechanic back up to the library up at, the, up at Southwestern. And I said, God, I don't know what you're doing here, man. You ever have a moment like that with God? I, I can't see what you're up to. Like, What's the point of bringing me and my brand new wife down here? It's hot fixing this car out on the asphalt to that parking lot. And now I, 
I don't got, and God just said, Tony, you think I brought you down here to go to seminary? I wish he talked to me this way all the time, man. But, he's, but as clear as day in my heart, God said, Tony, I got you out of Oklahoma and I brought you down here so I can get you away from everything. I could do a work in you. I said, okay. You know, it, 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 was, it was real close to that event that God opened up an opportunity for me to go serve back home near my dad in a time that he was going to need me. He had some health problems. But it was when I gave up on what I thought that God moved and began to work everything. The tuition that I couldn't pay, God made a way where there wasn't a way during that time in my life. And I would just want to tell you, sometimes God wants to bring us to a place where some things have to die where we, so we can trust him and learn to put all our hope and all our confidence in him. We can trust his perspective. Isaiah saw him and that he was high and lifted up. God, God had commissioned Isaiah to go tell Israel that in a short manner of time, if they did not change and repent, that they would be led into captivity for 70 years. And he, God knew that his people would need to be reminded that God had a plan and that they could trust him even in the midst of their impending situation. So God showed Isaiah that he was high and lifted up, that he had a perspective on the situation and what was going on in their life that even though from their vantage point, and it was very limited, that they could trust that God sits high on a throne and that he stays seated on the throne even in the midst of calamity and we can trust his character. Amen? Isaiah also said that while he was there, he witnessed the angels in a praise marathon crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Uh, the center of all of heaven's proclamation about our great God is that he is holy. In algebraic terms, one preacher said that God is holy to the third power, that this is his defining characteristic, that he is different, that he is set apart from sinful man, and that he is perfect in every way. You say, Pastor, I get it, man. I get God's different than me. What does that have to do what difference does that make in my crisis? Let me tell you, it makes all the difference in the world, knowing that God is perfect. It means that when you can't wrap your mind around what he's doing in the middle of your problem, you don't have to doubt his motives, that you can trust that he has your best interest, your best interest in mind and that you can trust his plan even when you can't see it. As one preacher said, when you can't trace God's hand, you can always trust his heart. Always trust his heart. Here's the next thing that you need to see. You can always cling to God's unchanging character. Here's the next thing. If we're going to have experience revival in the midst of our world being at crisis, it means that we need to come clean with the king. Did you see it there in verses 4 through 7? After he sees this vision of God on the throne, God speaks and things got all shook up. Amen? The Bible says it like this, that the, that the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called from the throne. That when God spoke, that things began to shake up. I believe this was God reminding Isaiah that his word is still powerful in the midst of a crisis and that we can trust him, that he can still change the situations that we're going through if his people will call on him. Just like that centurion said, all God's got to do is say the word and everything can change in a matter of minutes. Amen? Amen. When, I, when, I, when I was, uh, I was 20-something years old, still living, at folk, uh, living with my, my folks, trying to go back to college because I had a, made a, an attempt at college the first time and my uh, uh, GPA was an impressive batting average. So my folks let me move back in with them to try to get that cleaned up. Well, I'm there with my kid brother that there's only 17 years difference between us, and he never lets me know about that. And we're there in the house, and we hear this rumbling. It sounds like a convoy of semis coming down 3rd Street in Waleka, Oklahoma. And the ground starts rumbling, and I look up, and the, the doors on the, on the blanket cabinet are, are moving. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is an earthquake in Oklahoma. Well, I did the only thing I ever I knew to do. I grabbed a coat and I got him in the door jam of the house because that's what they do in the movies. 
And in a matter of seconds, it passed. Well, I never really knew what, a, what an earthquake was before that, never experienced that. I've experienced it since, but I've never experienced a heaven quake. But Isaiah did. When God spoke, he shook the heavens. I want to tell you, if God's people will put their trust in God and in his word, God still has the power in his word to say the word and to move heaven and earth for his people when we trust in him. That's the power that God wants to put to practice in our lives that he wants us to experience when we put our trust in his word. Some of us are saying, okay, preacher, but how come I don't experience his power in my life? I think it works like this. This week we had a, we had a construction crew come in. They have self-identified as the, bump, the, as the gum bumpers. Happened in the midst of some discussion. One of them came up and said, you know, with all this discussion, we might as well call ourselves the gum bumpers because that's all we're doing. Well, they started putting down these steps here and they were using an air gun and they couldn't get the gun to drive the nail in. It would shoot one out every once in a while, but it would but it'd stick out, leave sticking out. And one, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the guys looked over at the wall and said, well, I think I found the problem. And he walks over and he picks up the extension cord and he plugs it in. You know the thing started working after that? Can I talk spiritually with you th this morning? Some of us are wondering why there's no power in our lives and it's because we ain't plugged in in a while. God hasn't changed. We can trust him and God says that if we will plug into him through our prayer life and through the study and application of his word that we can see his power on the move in our lives again. Isaiah tells us one way that we do that, though, is that we have to confess sin in our life. When Isaiah got a picture of how good and holy God was, his response was, Woe is me, for I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. You have to understand that, according to the Bible, the words we say, the things that come out of our mouth reflect what's in our heart. Jesus said that we speak from the overflow of, of our heart. So Isaiah understood that the outward behavior that was coming out of his life and out of the lives of the people indicate, pointed to a problem that was deeper, a problem that they had on the inside of them, a heart problem. And I love how Isaiah started out when he was confronted with God's holiness, of God's goodness, his first response was, I need to get me right. Woe is me. Then he said, and woe is Israel. I'm a man of unclean lips. He pointed the fingers first at him to get his heart right and his relationship right with God, knowing that that's got to be the priority. Isaiah knew that revival needed to take place in his household and in the house of Israel, and if it was going to take place, it would take place when he got his life right with God first. I'm going to tell you some of the options Isaiah had before him. He, he could have pointed out there at Israel and he could have said, come on, God, I'm not as bad as the, some of the folks in Israel. But he knew that it was his heart and his life that needed to get right with God first. The key to revival is when God's people determine in their hearts that I'm going to, to be right with God regardless of the consequences, regardless of what it costs me, that the main priority of my life is to make sure that my heart is right with God. If we want revival, we need to get to the heart of some issues in our lives. God took care of this by when he made confession of sin in his life. God sent an angel over to the altar to take a coal. Aren't you glad we're under a different dispensation? Amen. This angel took a burning coal from the altar and touched Isaiah's lips and he told him that his sin had been atoned for. Scholars tell us that this that this altar was an altar that was pointing forward to the sacrifice of Jesus. Just as Moses had been instructing, instructed in the wilderness to build the tabernacle according to the pattern that he was shown, a pattern reflecting a heavenly reality of atonement that was happening in heaven, that this altar one day would point forward to the cross of Christ who would die in the place for our sin so that we could be forgiven. Listen, there's no other way. 
I wish, I wish I could tell you that, there, that you can be a good person, that you can try harder, that we can do better. But the, but the Bible's answer is that we need a payment. And we have a problem so deep that we've got to take our problem to somebody more qualified than us, and his name's Jesus. From time to time, y'all know I'm not a, not a, not a big suit wearer. Well, I, well, I'm working on that. But, but from time to time when I do wear suits, uh, you, you know, all you got to do is pull out your nice suit and go eat a Sunday lunch somewhere, and you'll get something on it. Amen? And if you know... None of the home remedies work to take a stain out of a suit. You've got to take it to somebody called a dry cleaner because they have a remedy and they've got a process and they've got a solution that can take the stain out of any garment. But if you're going to experience the cleansing, you've got to quit, give up on your home remedies and you've got to take it to somebody that's more qualified than you. The Bible tells us and the Bible teaches us that heaven's got a dry cleaning service. It's called the blood of Jesus. And that he can take out any stain if we'll bring it to him. And we can come clean with the king and experience revival. Here's the last thing that we see here in this passage. And I hope you're still with me this morning. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8 with me. And I want to tell you, if we're going to experience revival, we must answer the call of Christ. L look at this passage. And Isaiah, and Isaiah said, I, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Now, let me pull over and just tell you that this is the conversation happening within the Trinity. This is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit speaking to each other. Who shall I send, and who shall go for us? And Isaiah's response, without hesitation, without qualification, without reserve, was, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. Isaiah's response tells us that he was answering God's call on his life. He said, here am I. Send me. When God called Isaiah, he immediately responded, send me. And if you read the rest of chapter 6, you understand that he answered the commission of God knowing that even though he would be obedient to God, that the people of Israel would not listen. But he said, God, I'm answering your call. Regardless of other people's response, my response is, yes, Lord. I'm all in and I'm going to say yes to you because answering your call is more important than, than, and my obedience to your call is more important than anything else that I could ever do with my life. A while back I got a, a telephone call. And you, aren't you glad for caller ID? Amen. A lot of times it saves you a lot of grief from one of those folks trying to sell you some extended car warranty insurance. Well, it just came up on the screen, Washington, D.C. Well, I don't know anybody in Washington. I, 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 about, I thought it was one of those scams, but I didn't have anything better to do, so I answered the phone. And when the lady introduced herself, I remembered that some time before that I had sent a letter to a senator. Really thought it wasn't going anywhere. Conversation ended a bit ended up being one of the most significant conversations I'll ever have while I'm here on, on the planet. I got to speak with the office of, of the senator there. They, they took the time to talk to me. But it's because I hit the answer button instead of the decline button. If we want to see revival happen in our land, we have to understand the king of kings, he's not prank calling. He really has a call on our life, and he's waiting on some of us to hit the answer button and to tell him, I'm all in. I want to tell you, Isaiah knew that if revival had a chance at all, even knowing that the majority of the people in the land would not listen to God's word, he knew that if, it, if revival had a chance at all, that it needed a spokesman, and he was willing to go it alone in a crooked and dark generation to call people back to God and leave the results to God. I want to tell you this morning, revival in our need, in our time, needs some spokesmen and some spokesladies who will, who will speak up for Christ and stand out from the crowd. 
I believe today heaven wants to know where's the next Isaiah? Where's the next Ezekiel? Where's the next Jeremiah that'll stand for God and live for God when it's not popular? Where's the next Daniel that'll speak God's word into the culture? Where's the next Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that won't conform to the pattern of the world, whatever the cost? Where's the next Esther that knows that her life has been put here and she's been put here at this time for just such a time as this? Where's the next Mordecai that'll lead out in revival by calling a prayer meeting and by living and committed to prayer? Where's the next Ezra and the next Nehemiah that'll build their lives on God's word and lead by example to restore worship back to its proper place in the land? God's got one. It's time for somebody to say, yes, Lord, and to answer, I'm all in. Isaiah responded saying he was answering the call and that he would give God his all. He said, here I am. Here I am. In high school, we had this thing where at the beginning of the hour, the teacher would have the seating chart there and she would begin to call out names. And when your name came up, you'd say, here to indicate that you were present. When Isaiah answers the call, it is far more than simply acknowledging his presence. Instead, it is as if Isaiah picked up himself and laid himself down on God's altar and said, here I am, all of me. You can have every part of me. Here I am. Send me. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9 that God looks to and fro over the whole earth seeking those that he would give strong support to whose hearts are totally committed to him. That means God's looking for some people that will say, here I am, Lord. You can send me. My family needs you. My community needs you. My country needs you. This world needs you. You can have all of me. You can have all of me. Some of us might be hesitant to say that I'm not qualified, I'm not equipped. I want to remind you of the old adage that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. That God will equip those who will step out in faith and he's looking for somebody that will put their life in his hand. In sports we had this expression, coach would, in eight-man football you don't really have a lot of talent uh, to, to, uh, to, to lean on uh, besides those that you get on the field. You have a hard enough time getting the eight that'll play. And so, coach had this expression, next man up. When one of your teammates that was more qualified than you went down on the field, coaches start looking around, and you better have your helmet on, because when he called out your name, you were the next man up. And it was up to you to answer the call. I always loved when I heard that name, Lawson, because I knew this was my opportunity to step out on the field, to get some PT, to get some playing time, to help lead my team to glory, to help lead my team to victory. I want to tell you, our heavenly coach is looking out, and he's calling out your name, and he's waiting. What's your response going to be? What's your response going to be? I hope it's yes, Lord. Amen. Would you stand with me, and let's have a word of prayer. I want to tell you why you can tell him yes. Because he's already said yes to you. God knew that we have a sin problem, that we can't fix on our own. And so he sent his perfect son, Jesus, that John's gospel tells us that Isaiah saw seated on the throne. That Isaiah looked, at, looked and he saw Jesus and he knew that Jesus was coming to make atonement for our sin. God's vote's already in. His verdict is already in. He's already said, yes, I am willing to forgive. Yes, I'm willing to equip. Yes, I'm willing to restore. But he's waiting on your response this morning. Here in just a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to pray. And then this is your time to come and to make your profession known to him. Maybe you're here today and you would say,